Hey all, here are OS Reviews. Today we're taking a closer look at the Doogee V30T. This is the latest flagship from a company that's known for making rugged Android smartphones, and they're trying to prove you don't have to sacrifice on style as well as performance on a rugged device. Some of you guys may remember that a couple months back they came out with the V30 that had a pretty striking vegan leather orange backing, reminiscent of the LG G4 days. Now the new V30T further upgrades on that with the processor. Instead of using the Dimensity 900, which was already pretty fast, it's now going for the Dimensity 1080 5G processor that's built on a 6 nanometer architecture. It's very energy efficient, especially when coupled with a gigantic 10,800 milliamp hour capacity battery, which does support, luckily, 66 watt fast charging. This thing will last you for three to four days, really, before you have to recharge it again. Otherwise, we're still talking about similar specs, including 256 gigs of built-in storage, along with 20 gigs of RAM, namely 12 gigs of DDR5 RAM and 8 gigs of virtual RAM, which borrows on the storage if you need it in a pinch. It also has has high-res audio certification with the dual front-facing speakers. As a rugged phone, of course, it's going to be fully waterproof as well as dustproof. It's going to be resistant to shock in case you accidentally drop it. Has a 20 megapixel night vision IR camera from Sony and a 108 megapixel primary lens. A micro SD card slot can even further supplement the built-in storage and it doesn't skimp on the connectivity. Aside from 5G, it supports Wi-Fi 6. It also has the latest Bluetooth 5.3. NFC GPS powered by Android 12, which admittedly would be nice if they're looking towards Android 13, but it is a relatively clean version of the ROM at least, so not too obtrusive. The phone also has a 120Hz ultra-fast refresh rate display, which is 6.5 inches, Full HD Plus resolution, although it is an IPS LCD panel as opposed to AMOLED, which would have been nice. I will also mention that that main camera does have optical image stabilization. The performance of the Dimensity 1080 is comparable to the Qualcomm Snapdragon 778G, but we're also talking about a lower price point, plus a performance that will be faster than anything on the 400 or even Qualcomm 600 series. In fact, this thing has almost 2.5 times the speed of the Qualcomm Snapdragon 660 from a few years back. And we have the rose gold colored edition, which is pretty much just gold. Although, as aforementioned, you can also pick between the new marble texture plus a black texture as well, although the vegan leather finish is gone that you had on the original V30. Inside the box, there is a factory pre-applied screen protector, but there's also a second one in case that one wears down. And then down below, there is a bundled charger plus Type-C cable, which you also don't get on other brands, cough, cough, Apple, or Samsung anymore, and it's using Type-C supporting the full 66 watts. And this thing claims to juice up to 80% in just 30 minutes, which is relatively fast. So a closer look here at the design, it's of course going to be more of a chunky phone compared to your average smartphone since it essentially has this durable frame and you can think of it as a case that's permanently attached. In terms of footprint though, it's not too bad compared to the past rugged phones that we have reviewed, including the Umidigi Bison 2 that we just saw as well as the Unihertz tank that we also reviewed a couple months back. I think they are all having a similar, more durable aesthetic, but in contrast, uh, the Doogee V30 T, I will dare say, is a little bit more elegant and refined in terms of its finish. Always love it when manufacturers just put more attention and detail into their design. With that being said, those two phones do have a bit more of a modern display, namely through the cut out for the hole punch as opposed to a teardrop notch, as you can see there, which is something that I do think that Doji should start to incorporate. It'll make their phones just feel a little bit more immersive and similar to the competition since we are now heading into the second half of 2023 and the teardrop design, although not bad, is definitely starting to age itself a little bit. Anyways, returning to the design here, we have tactile keys for the volume as well as the power key that also serves as the fingerprint scanner, fairly accurate and responsive. There's a flap that covers up the Type-C port there on the edge, and then on the left-hand spine, you have access to the SIM card slot slash micro SD expansion slot, and there's also a programmable hotkey, like on most rugged phones. You're able to trigger different applications, including flashlight shortcuts, and then the texture on the rear, I would say, is a little bit more close to a polycarbonate finish, but it shimmers and also feels still very sturdy and dense. There's also the 
pretty impressive looking camera cluster which has some metal accents. What's neat is it doesn't really protrude from the edge of the phone just because it's already a little bit more bulky to accommodate that giant battery plus with the Duji logo there in the back it's not going to wobble when you set it down onto a surface which is pretty cool. And then the stereo speakers on the very top and on the bottom of the unit which is a nice little extra that most other mid-tier phones rugged phones just don't have. Of course, you do get slightly larger bezels on the top and bottom like we talked about, but it's not too bad, I'd say. At least it is a very fast refresh rate display, so everything feels quite smooth as you're using it. It's adaptive as well, so if you're using something that is not going to require that fast of an animation speed, it will dial itself back down to preserve on battery. Also offers pretty good viewing angles, fully laminated, of course, so there's no gap between the glass, which is Corning Gorilla Glass 5, and the screen underneath. Uh, with that being said, it's not the brightest screen that I've seen, which is something that I do want to see just a little bit brighter, especially on a rugged phone if you're using it in extreme conditions. With that being said, in most typical conditions, you're not going to find too many issues. Colors are also quite vibrant and punchy. There's a couple of custom wallpapers that also shows off what the display here is capable of reproducing. And again, all look quite good, I have to say, on this screen. So anyways, coming back to this Android 12 UI, as aforementioned, it's pretty stock fueling. You do have access to the drag up drawer for navigation, and you can find a handful of the typical Google applications pre-installed, plus of course the Play Store. And furthermore, you do get a couple of extra utility tools like on most rugged phones. In the toolbox, you have access to a compass, a decibel meter, as well as a height measurer. Can be useful for certain construction related work, as well as of course, if you are in the outdoors, you can find those extra utilities. But that's basically it. There's a voice recorder. Everything else is just built in stock from Android 12. So there's no bloatware here at all, which is excellent. Everything here can then be installed per your liking. Now talking about the, again, fingerprint scanner speed, it's always on and it is relatively fast to unlock, as you can see there, without really any hints of stuttering or slowing down, also coupled with that fast refresh rate display. Now the drag down notification shade has definitely been redesigned by Duji. I suspect it's inspired by iOS and Huawei's EMUI, but I don't hate it. You have access to common features like screen brightness, you can easily turn on the torch, and a lot of extra utility tools, whether it's in SOS mode, enabling different sensors, NFC, screen casting can all be found here. And if you're wondering, the V30T does have Qi wireless charging as well, even though it's not explicitly mentioned on any of the advertisements. Jumping into the camera next, it's relatively fast to launch, and the UI is pretty simple and easy to understand. We're able to tap on that tree icon to essentially transition between the wide-angle lens, which is again 16 megapixels, and the primary 108 megapixel lens. Of course, you will have a difference in quality, but the color science is actually not too far off between those two modes, and at least it's not 8 megapixels, so it still preserves a fair amount of detail. Otherwise, pretty simple on the settings here, we can further tap on things like geotag, you can change the picture resolution between 12 and 8 megapixels versus 108 megapixels. You have to tap on the separate icon there on the left to trigger. And depending on what it sees, it will trigger slightly different modes to optimize for color saturation as well as white balance. And it's generally good for things like food, common text that you're trying to scan, things like that. And the OIS definitely helps as well in mitigating some of the shakiness. I'm pleasantly surprised though that even in this 108 megapixel mode, it's not too slow when it comes to capturing images and still responds relatively quickly thanks to that processor. Now you can also capture video up to 4K, and there's a separate dial here for the IR night vision mode. Everything of course will be in black and white monochrome, but you can turn off all the light and the camera will still be able to make out details up to 10 to 20 feet in front of it. So similar to night vision home security cameras in that sense. And finally under more, you can capture GIFs. There is also a bokeh effect mode, which is using the secondary lens to capture depth and also a pro grade mode where you can further adjust properties like ISO, white balance yourself. So although I wouldn't say it's gonna beat the newest iPhone or the latest pixel necessarily in a camera showdown, just because of the computational photography algorithms on those phones are still superior in terms of processing, but the lens that they're using here is undeniably capturing a ton of detail. The OIS is for sure helping, keeping things relatively stable. Pretty good, I would say, for a rugged phone of its class. Again, aided by the ample RAM and pretty fast reception quality, you can just see how quickly this thing loads web pages. We can even try the full desktop version of the site, which is going to be more complex, but will still be no problem really for this phone to handle, as you can see there. 
Now moving into a video playback and also a speaker test of how it loads a YouTube clip. Let's crank up the volume. Some takeaways here being that the speaker quality can indeed get very loud, and it definitely has that stereo separation that we talked about. It's a pretty enjoyable experience. With that being said, like most phone speakers, it doesn't have a ton of bass. More than usable when it comes to watching back media, fast refresh rate, pretty accurate looking colors, and the screen is still large enough that it's comfortable for watching YouTube videos, even a few episodes of Netflix, and it still is holding its own. Here's also a quick look at the settings of the phone, and you can pick between standard standard Android bright as well as dark modes. There are additional gestures that you can trigger including three fingers for a screenshot as well as double click to wake up the screen and many standard Android 12 features including their one-handed mode. The memory expansion function again allows you to further augment 8 gigabytes from the storage into that virtual RAM. Last but not least the side key function allows you to program again what that key will do, including a single, double, and long press. Right now I've used a double click to trigger voice recording, as well as a long hold to trigger the flashlight as you can see there, which I think is pretty handy. So there's no games from the App Store, whether it's PUBG or Asphalt, that you aren't able to install and run on here. This is not a chipset that ever really gets hot or thermal throttles thanks to the 6 nanometer architecture. I found the phone to still be very cool after using it for 20-30 minutes of gaming, and everything still remained quite fast and fluid as well. Of course, if you are comparing it with the fastest Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 devices, you'll bound to find even smoother frame rates as well as perhaps even faster loading speeds, but honestly this thing is more than serviceable even if you're trying to do a bit of gaming here and there. Even more graphically demanding titles will run on here really without any problems. So that's more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Doji V30T. Overall, this is a pretty impressive showing when it comes to the style as well as the performance for a rugged phone. A lot of the essentials are nailed on here, including the long-lasting battery, which will again get you multiple days of usage before topping up. You can even lower the refresh rate of the screen if you want to further prolong the usage. Even the cameras are not shabby at all when it comes to resolution and detail. Minor quirks and improvements may include a display that gets a touch brighter and perhaps uses a hole punch cutout instead of that teardrop notch. But really, aside from that, I think this is a pretty impressive showing. You can check out additional details if you're interested in a rugged phone. The links below. For now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been the Doji V30T.